If you could turn your Bibles, if you have them with you, to 1 Samuel chapter 13, starting at verse 8. 1 Samuel 13, verse 8. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God from which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be a prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Turn now to same book, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And finally, chapter 18 and verse 12. Saul was afraid of David. Because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray now for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your Holy Spirit to be upon every mind in this place, that their perception of what I say will be interpreted, applied as you intend, upon my tongue that I'll be cleansed, that I might be your transparent instrument to say everything that needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Let me be very clear, very, very simple. Perhaps, Lord, could it be for someone this is a wake-up call. And may this word bring great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Could you be yesterday's man or woman? What do we mean by yesterday's man or woman? Well, it means partly... Your time is up. Although in the case of King Saul, he became yesterday's man and lived another 20 years. It means that you are no longer on the cutting edge of what God wants to do and what God wants to say. Jonathan Edwards taught us that the task of every generation is to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving, then move in that direction. Well, we're looking at defining moments in the major players of the Old Testament. And today we come to King Saul, Israel's first king. You may recall from last week that God did not want Israel to have a king. But God said to Samuel, let them have what they want, and God gave them a king. Now, next time we will be looking at David and the definitive moment in the life of David. When you compare the sins of David and that of King Saul, uh, it's a bit of a mystery. David committed adultery 
and then committed murder to cover up the adultery and got into more trouble. But I don't see that King Saul ever committed adultery. And yet he was the one that became yesterday's man and ended up tragically. Now, here's a man who took himself too seriously. That was his major problem. And then when I realized that, and I know if I'm candid with you, my greatest weakness, ask Louise, ask my closest friends, I take myself too seriously. No doubt about that then could I be preaching to myself today? And the answer is yes. I don't preach this message to give anybody a guilt trip because it, we might see a little bit of ourselves in King Saul. I know one thing, I don't want to become yesterday's man. Now, another irony when it comes to yesterday's man, uh, it has nothing to do with being made redundant, has nothing to do with retirement, has nothing to do with age. You can be young and become yesterday's man. King Saul was only 40. You can be old and be tomorrow's man. I love it. <laughs> Three weeks to go, and I'll be at the age when God began truly to use Moses when he was 80. Now, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, which Bruce just read, we have three possibilities of being yesterday's man, today's man, tomorrow's man. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, yesterday's man, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? He's speaking to Samuel, a type of Today's man, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. As we saw last time, Samuel had to go outside his comfort zone and stay outside his comfort zone as long as he lived. And then he says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Tomorrow's man. Now, interesting comparison between yesterday's man who still wore the crown and tomorrow's man, who had no crown, but was given a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because in verse 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And so you have this special anointing. Now, the word anointing, it's a tricky word. Sometimes it refers simply to who is king. And David would always refer to Saul as God's anointed. But there is another way it should be used, and that's the way I shall refer to it today, God's approval. The greatest thing you can have in this life is the approval of God. And what makes yesterday's man, yesterday's man, woman, is the anointing of God, approval, being lifted. Billy Graham once said that his greatest fear was that God would lift his hand off of him. What all of us want is to know God's approval. Well, yesterday's man is one who continues to function even though he has forfeited the blessing of the Holy Spirit. I think it was A.W. Tozer, but there have been others to say it. If the Holy Spirit were completely withdrawn from the church today, 90% of the work of the church would go right on as if nothing happened. And that can happen to an individual where a person continues on, not aware of any problem, but in fact, as described in those in Hebrews chapter 6, they could not be renewed again unto repentance. What that means is, they'd become stone deaf to the Holy Spirit. The writer of Hebrews warns that those Hebrew Christians could repeat the ancient era of Israel. And the problem with them is they did not listen to God's voice. 
And so you have the warning from Psalm 95, Hebrews 3. If anyone hear my voice. What I would hope in my talk today is everyone here would recognize God speaking to you. Because as long as you sense God is speaking to you and you are gripped by the word, it's a good sign. Well now, only Samuel knew that Saul was yesterday's man. So, he continues to be king. He wears the crown. He's got the following, the adulation, the prestige. And there are people like that today in Christian leadership. They have the mailing lists. They have the following. But they've lost God's approval. But only Samuel knew that. Well, I want us today to see the cause and effect of becoming yesterday's man. What is the cause? What is the effect? What is the result? And I want to begin with the effect. What is the result of being yesterday's man or woman? Well, one result is this. You are left to your own devices and what you were becoming more and more you now are that totally. And in the case of King Saul, he was consumed with jealousy. It all happened after David had his definitive moment when he killed Goliath. And all was fine. Everybody was thrilled. Even, even Saul was thrilled. Until they began to sing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. <laughs> You know, people can be so insensitive. They don't realize that a king has a big ego. And if you don't believe ministers have egos, you go up to any preacher and brag on another preacher and just see how much you make that one smile that you just told it to. Jealousy. We've got to be aware of it. Now, I don't want anybody here to have any sense of guilt if you have a problem with jealousy. We've all got this problem. But the thing is... When this happened, Saul was angry. And he says, what more can David get but the kingdom? And from that time on, he kept a jealous eye on David. And he spent the rest of his life trying to get rid of David. David, a 17-year-old teenager, you would have thought nobody would be threatened by a teenager. But Saul was. Because he knew that he had the hearts of the people. And would you believe it? Saul was more worried about young David than he was the enemy of Israel, the Philistines. That's how lopsided, how distorted one can be. Perhaps some of you are alive to remember when the first man walked on the moon and he was welcomed back to America in the South Pacific, and President Nixon went there to greet him. And President Nixon was on this battleship uh, waiting to know just when uh, the man would be let down on, into the Pacific and then welcome the man and congratulate him. But those that were next to the president said that Richard Nixon was far more intrigued with something that happened in the state of Massachusetts the night before than it was with a man who had uh, walked on the moon. And that was Senator Edward Kennedy the night before had taken uh, his friend Mary Jo Kopechny on an outing. And on the Chappaquiddick Bridge, they fell into the water and Mary Jo Kopechny drowned. And all suspected something. And Richard Nixon, being a political animal, knew that this would be the end of Kennedy's career. It was. And he was more excited about his enemy being defeated than the occasion that he comes to recognize the first man on the moon, which uh, Nixon referred to as the greatest thing since creation. Well, he had been wrong before. 
acting like he was so excited when his heart was thrilled because it meant his political future looked good. King Saul spent the rest of his life trying to get rid of David. The second result, complete loss of integrity. What is integrity? Transparent honesty. It's when you keep your word. It's when you tell the truth, when you're reliable. And King Saul made a promise. In fact, it was more than a promise. He swore an oath to his son, Jonathan, that he would not hurt David. Jonathan became David's friend. And he goes to his father and says, Father, please, this, you don't need to be afraid of David. He's your friend. He's not going to hurt you. And do you know, King Saul actually swore an oath to his son. And how do you know it's an oath? Well, it says, as surely as the Lord lives, those are his words, David will not be put to death. Now, are you aware of the difference between a promise and an oath? A promise you want to keep, and you want to keep your word. Uh, you may say, I will meet you at uh, Trafalgar Square, four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. I promise to be there. So you go, and the person's not there. They show up an hour later. They say, sorry about that, I got preoccupied. And then you d decide to meet again. This time we will meet... Uh, uh, on Notting Hill Gate, across from uh, uh, the theater, in front of Boots. I'll be there at 3 o'clock tomorrow. You sure? Now, last time you were late. No, I'll be there. You're an hour late. Now you don't know whether to believe the person. Well, in order to make you know, you swear an oath. Now, Jesus said, don't do that. Just keep your word. But in ancient times, if you ever swore an oath, you kept it. You kept it. Saul swears an oath even to his own son and says, I won't lay a hand on David and broke it by sundown that day. This is the sad thing about King Saul. He could not keep his word. And we're told that again and again, there was a time when David could have killed Saul and become king. He just took a piece of his robe and, and wanted to show how he could have done it. And then his conscience smote him for that, and he was sorry he even did that. He became so tender and sensitive to the ways of the Holy Spirit. He, he was sorry. And then he had another chance to get rid of call, uh, Saul and, and refused to do it. And in fact, it comes out of 1 Samuel 26. He said, as surely as the Lord lives, and this is David swearing an oath. The Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come or he will die. He will go into battle, but I'm not going to lay a little finger on him. And David kept that word. And even then, when King Saul knew that David could have killed him, he says, is that you, my son, David? He's acting so pitiful and sincere. He says, I have sinned. I have played the fool. I'm so sorry, I won't bother you again. He lied. He kept trying. A man like this loses all integrity. Just be conscious of this. Always be a man and a woman that keeps your word. True integrity it is almost perished from the earth. But let it not be said of any who profess the name of Christ. Well, Another thing about being yesterday's man, they lose all sense of self-respect. And you do that which makes sure people will remember you. Do you know that King Saul even made a monument to himself? In 1 Samuel 15, verse 12, he made a monument to himself because he could see his day was coming. He was afraid nobody would remember him. There are only two people in the Bible that made monuments to themselves while they were alive because they were afraid nobody would remember them. One was King Saul. The other was Absalom, David's son who tried to steal the kingdom. 
You know, I worry about anybody who is so obsessed with his reputation, worried about his future, make sure I'm remembered. Does it worry you whether you're remembered the day after you go or a year later or a hundred years later? Who cares? But there are those that's so important to them. There was a man in America, the patriarch of the Southern Baptists, actually had a hand in hiring the greatest sculptor in the world to do a statue of himself. You can see it. Go to First Baptist Church, Dallas today, and you can see it. Larger than life, bronze statue. Imagine having that done. But he did. And I can just picture him at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's expecting to get a reward. And the Lord Jesus says, Oh, I'm so sorry. You've already had your reward. Let me tell you the most important reward there is. And that is not how you are envisaged below what kind of reputation you have. Let me tell you what matters more than anything in the world. A verse of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and here is the way he puts it. He said, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. And that's when the truth is known. One other thing about King Saul, he abandoned the very laws that he instituted while he was king. They were good laws. He outlawed anything of the occult, any kind of witch. It was not on. But in the end, he was so desperate. He had to have some kind of word. Isn't it amazing? People looking for a word, and if they can't get it from God, they'll turn to their astrology chart. Don't do it. That's the devil. But some who just want some kind of word, they'll go to a fortune teller. Don't. King Saul did. He went to the witch of Endor. Endor is a, is a village. I go to Israel every year, and you can come to a little place in the road coming up the west bank. Endor, five kilometers. I, thought, I just don't want to go there. I just don't want to get near that place. But it's history. And he went to the witch, and when she saw who he was, she said, well, you are the one that outlawed this. He said, it's all right. You're not going to get in trouble. Had her bring up Samuel for him. That's another subject. I won't go into that now. The point is that it was on this day that Saul admitted what was true for years. Arguably the saddest words in the Bible. 1 Samuel 28, verse 15. God is departed from me and answers me no more. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, my spirit will not always strive with men. Well, now, how did it happen? What is the cause? I want to say to you now that I've racked my brain all week how to make this a happy sermon. This is a sobering word. And I'm not wanting anybody to feel guilty but I want to say as lovingly as I know how, I'm preaching this, not because I think you're yesterday's man, because if you were, it's too late. But if just maybe there's a word here for someone and you know what God has been seeing, uh, saying to you and what you've seen, but you said, no, the cost will be too great. And yet one more time, he's come today. Don't be a fool. If you know the Lord is speaking to you, welcome it with both hands and say, thank you, Lord, for as long as you hear him speak and you're gripped and you think, God is on my case. That's good news. Be thankful. All right. How did King Saul get into this mess? Number one. He put himself above Holy Scripture. And that is what Bruce read to you 
earlier. Here is the definitive moment in the life of King Saul. Now, all these messages over the last several months on defining moments of major people in the Old Testament, they're always good moments. These are the uh, happy moments, what changed their lives. But the defining moment for King Saul was not a happy moment, and he was never to be the same again. And it's when he put him himself above Holy Scripture. It's when they're waiting for Samuel to come. And for some reason, Samuel's held up. And Saul says, we're not going to wait any longer. He should have been here. He said he would be here. And suddenly makes an announcement that should have given everybody horror. He says, bring me the burnt offerings. Bring me the fellowship offerings. Oh, dear. Someone should have said, uh, your majesty, sir, how do I say this? I don't think you're supposed to do that. They were afraid to say it to the king. If they had said it to him, he would say, I'm king, aren't I? Don't tell me what I can't do. He thought because he was king, he was an exception. You know, there's something about the evil of the human heart. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, even if we're not king. We tend to say, I realize everybody else should have to go by that, but I have a special understanding, and God knows my need and my weakness. And you put yourself above Scripture. Don't be a fool. God will not bend the rules for any of us. Well, you say, well, what did he do wrong? I'll tell you. He went right against the ceremonial law. There is what theologians would call the threefold use of the law. It's not in the Bible just like this, but it's a way to help you understand. The moral law would be the Ten Commandments, the civil law, how the people of Israel should govern themselves, and the ceremonial law, how the, uh, God wanted to be worshipped. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy makes it clear that only the person called of God could offer the burnt offerings. Well, Samuel said, this is no big deal. Bring me the burnt offerings. Let me tell you how big a deal it is. Whereas King Saul became yesterday's man as a result of it, sometimes a good person can make the same mistake, but God is no respecter of persons, and one will pay for it. In 1 Samuel 26, verse 18, did you know that the king Uzziah, one of the best kings they ever had, made the same mistake? In fact, they said to Uzziah, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense. That's for priests, the descendants of Aaron. And he thought, well, I'm king. And the next thing you know, he is afflicted with leprosy and had to be buried in a separate place. And great though his life had been, do you know what they said about it after he died? You know what they remember? He had leprosy. Great king, he had leprosy. President Nixon was a great president, believe it or not. He's the one that opened China. But you know what they think of when they mention Richard Nixon? Watergate. Bill Clinton believe it or not, was a very good president. But you know what they remember? Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> and so with Uzziah, he had leprosy. So you need to know that when it comes to God's Word, did you know this is the Holy Spirit's greatest product? And he hasn't apologized for any word the worst mistake you can make is to underestimate any part of it and say, well, that was in their age. That was in their day. And I've been thinking lately more and more what is told around nowadays. The phrase, redefinition of marriage. Heard about that? People marrying the gender of their own sex. And they say, it's marriage. We just redefine marriage. Do you not know who defined marriage? 
It's a creation ordinance. Genesis 1, 27, male and female created he them. And when political leaders, religious leaders go against this, they don't realize how serious, how serious it is. And I can tell you, that, I can tell you now, any political or religious leader who goes along with this redefinition of marriage will regret their decision with incalculable bitterness and the nation will suffer. King Saul took lightly God's infallible word. Second, King Saul was accountable to nobody. You see, he was made king. He was supposed to be accountable to Samuel. But he wouldn't listen to Samuel. Samuel couldn't reach him. Let me tell you the famous last words of yesterday's man. You ready for this? I am accountable to God. Listen, nobody is that spiritual. We need to be accountable to those around us. Oh, I'm just accountable to God. It's not good enough. If you really are accountable to God, you want people around you to tell you, I've got friends and I thank God for them. They will say, RT, you cannot say that. You must not do that. And they're not afraid of me. They tell me, I need it. And so do you. You need friends that know where you are at any moment. When I was at Westminster, there was a well-known man, you would know his name, famous for his prophetic gift, an extraordinary gift, I have to tell you. And uh, he had done us a lot of good. Then he wanted to be a member of Westminster Chapel. I said, no, you can't. You live in Dallas, Texas. Well, he said, Billy Graham lives in North Carolina, and he's, he's a member of First Baptist Dallas. Why can't I be a member of Westminster Chapel? I said, well, you need to come for six months. He said, well, what if I listen to six months of your tapes? <laughs> you know, I'm ashamed to tell you, we bent the rules and the deacons approved. We let him in. He became a member. As soon as he became a member, he stopped returning my phone calls. I couldn't catch up with him. I finally did. I said, you're supposed to be accountable to me. You're not accountable to me. I don't think you're accountable to anybody. I don't know what's going on in your private life, and I'm worried. And I said to him, these are my very words, in our flat in Westminster, I said, you, if you're not careful, will become yesterday's man. And he started to cry. And I thought, good. <laughs> Until the next day, when I saw by his spirit, it was another king Saul, he wept before David and said, I'll be different. He wasn't, and this man wasn't. And a couple years later, I could take you to the spot in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport where a friend of mine met me to say, have you heard about calling his name? I said, no, what do you mean? You don't know? No. He said, well, your friend has been on a moral free fall, found out he was involved in homosexual promiscuity and he'd fooled me completely. And I, it was one of the worst moments Greatest shocks in my whole life. And I warned him, do people know what you're doing? What is in your private life? I don't mean to be unfair, but be sure your sin will find you out. He was accountable to nobody. And the last point, which is borderline what I've just said, he would not take advice. King Saul would not take advice. And he wouldn't even listen to the man who put him where he is, Samuel. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. God gave Saul a second chance. He did. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And 
he was warned that he would not spare any of the sheep and cattle of the Amalekites, but to destroy them all. That was what he was told to do by Samuel. But he wouldn't. He thought he had a little wisdom above Samuel. He said, guess what? I, I've kept the good. And it's too late. This is when you have those famous words, to obey is better than sacrifice. And that finished King Saul off. He wouldn't take any advice. Is there somebody trying to tell you something? As lovingly as they can, they're warning you. But they're afraid. They walk on eggshells around you. And it may be that somebody very close to you is saying, you must be very, very careful. And now you're here. And now this word. This week at IBIOL, we did some of the parables of Jesus. And here's one. Uh, it almost reads by itself. Don't need to say much about it. It's Luke 13, verse 16, the parable of the fig tree. Jesus said a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it, but he didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. It shows the extreme patience of God. But then there comes a time when even God says, enough is enough. And as it is put in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1, a man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Well, that's about it for today. I'm sorry that this has been pretty sober. And uh, I feel like the predestinarian who fell down the steps and then wiped his brow and said, I'm sure glad that's over. And I've got this sermon over. But the word has been put to you. And yet the most important question, do you know for sure if you, were to, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven, do you? And if you were to stand before God, you will. And he were to ask you, he might, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Suppose it's the real thing, you're standing before God and he, and he says, why should I let you in? And there's only one answer. Give the wrong answer, you have to go someplace else, don't want to go there. What would you say? So right now, I want you to be as honest, show personal integrity with yourself. What would I say? I'm standing before God, and you won't have your friends to whisper the answer. You won't have anybody supporting you. And you're told right now, give the answer. Why should I let you into my heaven? What comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? Could I say lovingly to you, if the thought, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, does not come to your mind, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for anything in the world. But we can sort that out right now. If it did not cross your mind, to say, in fact, not just cross your mind, but to say, this is my hope. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross, if that's not your hope, I can give you a prayer to pray. If you can repeat the words with all your heart and sincerity, repeat them. 
don't need to say it out loud. Just say it in your heart. God will see you. Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you. Thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to die on a cross for my sins. Wash my sins away by your blood. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my heart. As best as I know how, I give you my life.